place. Um, and then next we are going, um, I'm going to pass it over to Francis. Um, and I heard you speak at uh, Momentum. So I'm very excited um, to hear you speak again and host this panel. So I'll pass it over to you. It's fantastic to be here and I apologize. I'm sitting at the airport. So I'm going to hope hoping that I'm not going to get interrupted by too many uh, loudspeaker announcements. And I am thrilled. I've also got my wonderful friend and colleague here, Claire Amos, and I know she's on the call somewhere. Who is, oh, there she is. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so Claire and I are going to have a conversation around education. So if you're hanging out in this space right now, the topic is all around education. My, my view is from 26 years in higher education and currently running and founding um, Academy EX, which is a postgraduate faculty in Tamaki Makoto. And Claire is all about compulsory sector as the principal. And, and since, well, she's been educated for, for years and years, but currently the principal of Albany Senior High School, a very progressive high school. Um, so let me just do a quick intro to Claire before we kind of kick off the session. So um, great to see everyone in this room, lots of familiar names, and uh, hopefully over the next 45 minutes, we'll talk about some fascinating things. Occasionally, I may just have to mute myself if it gets a bit chaotic here on the loudspeaker and clear on me. I've let you just to kind of jump on in uh, and fill the void if you don't mind, if that happens. Of course, um, happy to. <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> Look, and for those who don't, who don't know Claire, which is probably unlikely, um, she's such an incredible education disruptor, particularly thinking about what's going on in our compulsory sector, but with an even finer lens on the secondary school sector. Um, she is also, apart from being a principal, she is a member or the board of NetSafe, which is obviously incredibly important. Uh, she is a advisory board member of the William Pike Challenge. She's a member of Global Woman. She's a Google certified educator and innovator. She is also a co-founder of Disrupt Ed New Zealand. And on a personal level, as we are friends, which always makes these conversations so much more fun, as I know she's passionate about her family, about tattoos. Uh, the T-shirt might give it away today, Claire. Uh, but also, <laughs> oh, ah, I love it. <laughs> but, uh, but also uh, roller skating, which, uh, a very different kind of roller skating than I used to love in, in the 1980s, where um, mine was outdoors and around roads and streets. Yours is a little more sophisticated and curated and choreographer. <laughs> choreographer. Well, I'm not sure how mine. sophisticated it is. <laughs> it looks pretty impressive online, I have to say. So if you, if you don't follow Clee, just follow her for her, her roller skating moves is, is pretty impressive. Um, so look, oh, Clee, do you want to add anything to that before we kick off? Um, yeah, kia ora, ko Claire Whakaungua, I'm Te Mawaki, um, Principal at Albany Senior High School and um, I have had the privilege of being in the education sector for 25 years and um, more recently have been um, a Deputy Principal at a startup store at Hobson Ballpoint Secondary School and um, for the last five years Principal of Albany Senior High School and a long time um, friend and colleague of Francis's. So I'm just really looking forward to having this conversation. I'm passionate about um, us evolving and actually making our education system fit for purpose, even if it doesn't feel like our politicians feel the same at the moment. Um, but um, yeah, I'm passionate about um, education as a mechanism for social justice, about addressing inequalities, um, and about ensuring our young people actually have the skills and the competencies um, they need to thrive in the future. Awesome. Thanks for that, Claire. And, and my take on education as a tertiary educator and someone who's been involved with postgraduate studies, it's really about how do we make education relevant for the changing workforce needs. Uh, we have a big fascination on people in the uh, sort of in the front loading part of their lives, the so zero or five to 22 years. And actually, I think often we forget there's a whole bunch of people who are actually over 22 who do want to continue to learn uh, and actually have to learn because the world is changing. More specifically, as a technologist, I'm super interested in where we're going with artificial intelligence, where we're going with changing demographics uh, across Aotearoa, and actually how we're going to have the right people and the right skills. If we don't have enough people already, it's only going to get a lot worse uh, in coming decades if we don't all kind of get on the bandwagon and figure out how to learn these new and exciting tools that help uh, do our jobs, but also just about meaningful engagement as, as, we, uh, you know, as we move through our careers. So um, in terms of, uh, we'll, I'll follow the chat as much as I can, just to see any um, 
questions that pop up. Otherwise, we'll just launch into a conversation and uh, let, let's uh, just kick off and talk broadly about um, some of the bigger issues. So, Claire, I'd start by just saying we know that education in your sector, the secondary school sector, has been massively disrupted over recent years, obviously driven by COVID, only time I mentioned that word, uh, but actually, more importantly, what we discovered through that process around resilience, around students' um, alignment to future careers, assessment mm. challenges, uh, technology inequality, uh, anxiety, let's keep going. So do you want to just give a kind of a play of what you see in, in your world and actually what are some of those real considerations, both positive and negative, of recent years? Absolutely. So um, I, I've been a long time sort of advocate and, and really passionate about educational futures. Um, at this point, I want to give Cheryl Doig a shout out. I saw that she was lurking in the chat somewhere. Um, she's a stunning educational futurist. And I know whether you've been Christchurch based, you will know her well. Um, and someone who I've learned a lot from over the years. Um, I, I think what we've seen for a long time, and I've seen it really heighten in the last 10 years or so, is a bit of a mismatch between um, what our young people need and what our compulsory schooling sector serves up. So um, we have seen that um, we know with the advent of technology um, that what people need to learn and how they need to learn has changed. We do have a real challenge with um, our digital divide in New Zealand and that um, we're playing on an uneven playing field. So um, I think one of my real concerns is that since COVID and since the lockdowns, we've seen um, well-being issues skyrocket with our young people. We've seen increased disengagement from learning um, and a desire for students to engage with their learning um, really differently in terms of being in school, out of school. They've got increased pressures, um, particularly with the cost of living crisis. We have young people who are an important part of um, supporting their, their family. And so they may need to work more as well as being educated. Um, we have a, a world that is changing around us and a very, very firm industrial model ingrained in our schools. Um, as perverse as it sounds, I was, quite excited, it's, it's, that's the wrong way to frame it, when COVID came along in terms of the potential disruption that it um, represented. Because I thought, like many um, around me, thought this was going to be it. This was going to be the thing that disrupt schools once and for all. Um, this was going to really upend how we teach, what we value, um, how we meet the needs of our young people. Yet what we've seen happen, and I've been just traveling, I've just come back from educational conference in Australia as well, and I know they're battling with the same thing. Rather than actually leaning into the disruption and the changes that are needed, we're actually seeing the pendulum swing right back the other way. And we're seeing it in our recent educational policy announcements um, that the response to the disruption has to be doubled down on structure and going back to basics and a one-size-fits-all model of education. And so I am concerned that we're at risk of a bigger chasm than ever between what schools are actually designed up to do and deliver and what the needs of our young people are. Like we've got these nonsense conversations around attendance and these punitive measures for like whipping the families and whipping the kids and forcing them to re-engage in full-time schooling. There's very few people having conversations about the fact that full-time schooling in its traditional context, is that even relevant anymore? And, and of course, you can't change those systems whilst we have a digital divide in our country as well, because of course, until every young person and every family has access to the tools and the technologies and the digital skills to use them effectively, as well as the teachers and the school leaders, um, you can't you can't do things radically differently either. So um, that's that's where my head's sitting at. I'm constantly thinking about the fact that I have increasing amount of young people struggling with their well-being and having real mental health crises and their families having mental health crises. I see the world of work changing and I see the world of our secondary schools and our schools remaining steadfastly pretty much the same. 
Thanks, Claire. And I think some of these conversations we've had, uh, you and I, and mm. there's some questions coming through which kind of align to this. And um, I think one of the things is we, we're talking here about well, mm. someone's got a question around gender fluidity. Uh, I know we've talked a lot about neurodivergent people. You've got people mm. ADHD. You've got different learning styles. We know that you know schools are, are now sort of the, the sort of almost the frontier of some of this change. You've got young people exploring who they are in a different way. Mm. You know, maybe we can just talk about one. You've got a system that's still based around this industrial model with very little flexibility, and also like you're saying, someone's doubling down on going back to old ways, which make it even harder for someone who's non-traditional in whatever sense that might be. But also on top of that, we know better ways of learning, but it's not universal across the adoption. And some people understand it and your school is very progressive in that way. But can you just talk about some of those other types of learning that you're starting to see with, with you know, in terms of, I know the school you're at does attract a lot of people who, who are looking for a different type of learning experience. So maybe just if you can bundle all of that together and somehow yeah. so, talk um, about we're, the student. We're a senior only school. We're one of the few schools in New Zealand that don't have a uniform. Don't get me started on that topic. Um, you know, I've got this theory that schools need to be a safe place for absolutely everyone and that young people should walk through the door and belong exactly as they are. Um, as a result of that sort of belief system in our school, we have become somewhat of a magnet school for neurodiverse, um, gender diverse young people, people that have potentially struggled to fit in um, to the schooling systems that they've been at up till the end of year 10 or 11 and 12. So they come across to Albany Senior High School and join us there because it does, um, we work really hard to meet the needs of all of our young people. I, I get really frustrated because we have um, the, the NALPS, the National Education and Learning Priorities that have been set down for us by the government. And um, they, they actually talk very clearly about the fact that um, schools have to prioritise well-being, address bullying, make sure that they're incredibly inclusive spaces. And unfortunately, that is not always the case. Things that we do at our school um, to try and address those things, and I know schools are doing it more and more across the country, is we have real belief systems around um, universal design for learning. So um, it's not just about differentiation and having different modes of learning. It's about approaching every learning experience so that you're um, trying to design it in such a way that it can um, be um, engaging and meet the needs of absolutely everyone in the classroom. So there's often opportunities for co-design, um, student choice and personalization in that space. We've also really lent into the current flexibilities of NCA and uh, we have a focus on responsive assessment um, practices. So that means that we are open to always negotiating how people are assessed, when they're assessed, if they're even ready to be assessed. We work in partnership and alongside them. Um, and um, we also have a real focus on project-based learning. So Albany Senior High School has been open 14 years now from day one. They have dedicated a whole week I mean, sorry, a whole day every week on a Wednesday to students being engaged in large-scale, long-term um, impact projects, which use a design thinking framework. We work with external stakeholders and partners. Um, it might be community, it might be business, it might be iwi, um, to come up with um, real, very real projects that students are working on that have... Um, very tangible outcomes, whether it be a business or a product or a service or an action or an activation. Um, they might be building a um, VR game. They might be building um, an educational package that they're working with local primary schools on. And therein lies one of the things I think we need to recenter our education system around. And that is giving young people a sense of purpose and giving our young people the skills and competencies to be problem solvers and young people who can solve the wicked problems that we're facing. Because to me, it does not only makes them develop the skills and the competencies they need for workplaces, design thinking is um, endlessly transferable in terms of a framework and a skill set, it also gives them a sense of um, well-being. 
service learning is incredibly important. As ever, many of you, all of you will know here, the importance of that social entrepreneurial space and making a difference. Um, young people often need to get out of their heads, get out of their little social media echo chambers and be given an opportunity to really um, make a difference for someone other than themselves. So um, I know we're not alone in our focus on project-based learning. I know you've got the, the incredible Discovery and Unlimited, Hagley High School, um, Hayata and um, Rolleston and a whole lot of other schools down south that are doing fantastic uh, work in that space. So I'm frustrated because if I'm honest, um, there's not a lot in the NCA changes and the NZC refresh that reframes how we approach teaching and learning and making it more focused on skills and project-based learning. Those of us who are doing it are doing it in spite of. One thing that is really powerful that is coming through in the NZC refresh and the NCA changes and in a lot of the work um, that um, the ministry are doing that I think is the most valuable thing we've done in years is the focus on motoranga Māori and mana ōrete motoranga Māori and ensuring that we are working really hard to not just weave in topics and, and you know, Māori writers and artists and contexts. It's about taking those principles around um, manaakitanga and whanauna, um and, and, and those sort of things, ako, and the way that we approach our teaching and learning, which is really, really powerful. And I personally would put a stop on a lot of the other changes around NZC and NCA, and I would double down our focus on um, motoronga Māori because actually so much of that actually aligns with what we need for, for making and designing a better future for our young people. And, and the idea of power sharing is really woven into that as well. Yeah, I think you're certainly not the only one who thinks that way, and I, I totally concur on that approach. Just um, before we just kind of talk, to, there's a question here around your results. You know, obviously having a school that's not mainstream as, mm. as others, how does that compare in terms of academically so, with others? Let me tell you about our results. So um, in terms of our academic results, we, we, we do fine. You know, we get kids getting good results in terms of level two and level three NCA. We're not necessarily knocking it out the park in terms of um, university entrance, and we certainly don't focus unnecessarily on kids getting scholarships, but all of that is by design. Um, so we have, our board has uh, made a commitment to the fact that how we measure success is not how we compare to other schools on any kind of national league table. I'm sorry, David Seymour, I'm not going to be doubling down on that one for you. Um, but what we, how we measure success is we meet with the student, with their whanau, and we can co-construct an academic and personal target for the year. Um, that may look like a combination of an academic um, outcome, a well-being outcome, something they want to achieve um, and do that goes beyond academics as well. And we actually publish those on KMAR, which is our student um, management system. And our measure of success is how many of our young people we support to meet their personalised goal. I think this idea of a one-size-fits-all conveyor belt of success um, is an absolute nonsense and does more damage than good. I think what we want schools to be doing is adding value and to be measuring progress. I, I have um, a couple of my girlfriends. Um, Louise is principal at Edgewater College. Um, Kitty Tuketo is principal at Sir Edmund Hillary. They've got very, very high Māori and Pacifica um, communities. Louise in particular has quite um, a really high recent immigrant community within the Edgewater um, community. They have absolutely been slammed by these um, newly introduced NCA co-requisites. And what those co-requisites don't recognise is that you might have people coming into your high school at um, level one or level two of the curriculum. So, you know, we, we by the time you're going through senior school, you're supposed to be level six, seven, eight of the curriculum. Um, because they may be recent immigrants, because they may be English sec uh, second language learners, 
for a whole lot of different reasons, they may come into that school really low. Those kids are being told and being shown that they're failing within the education system as soon as they come into high school now with these bloody literacy and numeracy co-requisites. You know, I value every young person leaving school being numerate and literate, but what I don't value is them being measured and having a little sort of um, a gate that determines whether they can get a sense of success early on. I want young people to be getting um, recognition for where they come into the school at, how they progress, how they demonstrate their skills and competencies in a wide range of ways. Of course, it's our job to support them to become numerate and literate. Um, but I worry that what we're seeing across the board on the political sphere is a focus on increased testing. Testing, we all know weighing the pig isn't the way to change how we do things and to change outcomes. All it does is amplify um, the sense of a lack of success. It has negative impact on well-being. It's going to have a negative impact on whether those young people engage in school. If you can be earning $23 an hour down the road, um, working at the warehouse, working at Countdown, you go to school and you get told that you're failing um, early on, what are the choices that you're going to make? You know, I, we need to make schools safe, sticky places to be. I want schools to be flexible. I want our young people to be able to work as well as attend school. I want them to be wanting to be at school because it's a place that's not just a learning hub. It's a health hub. It's a place where they're... Um, developing skills and competencies, that their cultural is being, culture is being celebrated and recognised, that those young people are being celebrated for being exactly who they are. And actually, the fact that they've turned up to school is a reason. Um, I get really worried that this drilling down and back to basics and um, increased focus on testing and punishing families for kids not attending is exactly what we don't need at this point yeah, in time. Clear. Interesting Sorry. enough, so uh, no, no, good, a good range. I, I I'll be going on range and on. <laughs> no, and, and look, I think the thing is, in my world, at postgraduate studies, you know, the average age of my students, 44. So they've had a big gap between seeing, you know, someone who maybe comes out of your school and when I see them. But I can tell you of my students, the number of them who have had horror stories, like deep scars from their schooling experience, who've never wanted to go back into the system again because of the system, which hasn't shifted significantly in between. And so, for example, we have 25% of our students at postgraduate level who are Māori and Pacific, who, who basically had written off any future education after leaving their secondary school because of the experience that worked so much against them as learners. So it's interesting to think we're still, all these years later, having the same conversations around the fit for purpose kind of nature of education for what we need today, which is where I want to go uh, a little bit now, where we take the next step is if we know this around education that it's not suiting everybody it's not suitable for vast numbers of the or percentage of the population why are we still here and before you answer that one is because every time i talk to a parent who is has a sort of a conservative view of education the second they have a 13 year old they kind of change their views so suddenly they have suddenly faced themselves with a, a young person you know, 13, 15 years old in this system and suddenly realise how most of them, unless they are highly academic, do not thrive in a traditional environment. But obviously most of the decision makers don't have 13 year olds and are not mm. familiar with the current misalignment. So do you think it's just purely we've got decision makers who are not sort of at the coal face of what's going on in the world and what's going on in education and the alignment or misalignment? Or do you think it's deeper than that? Like what's your view about why are we still here after 25 years of these conversations? We haven't moved the dial as much as we yeah. have in pretty much every other sector. I'm, I'm actually blown away by how determined the education system is to not change and how determined many of the educational leaders are not to change the system that they know. If I could have a dollar for every time I've talked to a principal about what we're doing and um, you know why aren't schools doing X, Y, and Z, and they come back to me and go, oh, our community wouldn't want that. Well, you know what? Sometimes our community doesn't want it either. I, I've just finished doing my um, master's study looking at community perception of innovative learning environments and particularly um, what informs their perceptions. We have a real trouble, we have real problems that our education system is wedded to government 
to politics, policy, and um, fundamentally, our um, politicians care more about votes than they do about really strategic change in education. They want clickbait worthy headlines that reassure parents about um, really, really secure things. So you get that whole um, banning cell phones in high schools because that's going to solve a whole lot of problems. It's uh, Or you get the whole, we're going to tell people that they have to um, do so much teaching of reading and writing and that's going to solve the literacy and numeracy problem. Um, politicians are absolute superstars of coming up with simplistic clickbait worthy solutions to complex problems at the end of the day changing the education system is actually um really really tricky and calls for incredible levels of energy and courage and i note that someone made a comment about teacher burnout we're also seeing a hell of a lot of school leader burnout as well around the country if you are burning out if you are exhausted and you are not feeling valued, um, you are going to be far less likely to um, dig deep and really radically fight and change the system. Because as it is set up at the moment, the system is not going to be transformed by government. It's not going to be transformed by educational policy. It's going to be transformed by people on the ground, by the fabulous people at Grow Wait um, Waitaha. Have I pronounced that correctly? I know there's a, um, quite a few of you um, here. And and Cheryl, we should actually invite Cheryl to add some comments. She's doing a great job in the, um, the comment section as it is, but she, she knows this full well. The way that we change education is from the ground up. I think we're having a bit of an issue at the moment that people have seemed to have lost their steam post-COVID. We've, we've not only got young people and families who are fragile, we have got a whole lot of educators and educational leaders that are struggling with their well-being and their energy levels as well. And it's a shame because now is the time to actually jump in and do it. I'm really lucky. I have a, a really courageous board who are uh, willing to back me to um, evolve how we deliver education. We're looking to set up um, a satellite campus long term in the city and have our kids half off site doing um, increased amounts of project based learning, increased amounts of self directed learning. Um, my board are backing that, even though if you are, went out to my parent community tomorrow and said, is that what you want? They would say no, because the chances are they don't actually understand why we need to change things. They can actually be working in an open plan office. They can be part of the gig economy. They can be um, someone that has a flexible working week. They can be someone who works from home. Um, they might have a four-day working week. Yet you ask them what they want from the schooling. They want school to be a play, safe place. They can deposit kids, know that they're going to be there for five days a week, three till nine till three thirty, because that helps them in their life as well and and, and the complexities that they're dealing with. Um, they, for the most part, the people who respond to those surveys, school serves them pretty well. Um, and so they don't necessarily see the need for change, even though the world has changed irrevocably. Um, and I think that comes through in things like that blooming cell, banned cell phones, you know, policy. Actually, just on that, Claire, I just want to interject because uh, you're probably aware that every state uh, from the next semester in Australia is banning cell phones and actually Except for Queensland. Queensland. Yeah. No, but Queensland, <laughs> on the first, yeah, but in the first semester of next year, they are. So they've also closed oh, right. the line. So the whole of Australia by, you know, first term of next year, we'll all be banning cell phones. Now, on one hand, you could say, well, actually, from an anxiety point of view, if you're taking yeah. a social media piece, you're saying actually having less content to social media during the school day probably can get people more on focus. Yeah. On the other hand, it's a tool and device that's really super useful, and particularly in addressing the digital divide through the day, but also it's, it's a resource on many, many levels. So, you know, again, if we're seeing countries that are mainstreaming oh these capital, kind of quite yeah. radical views, how do you, how do you work with that? Um, when oh. because it, it sounds like a really populist kind of idea that go okay I get it that should be quite yeah. quite useful yeah um, I I, th I think we need to have people that are willing to continue to break the rules 
I mean, I, 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 I have to admit, like we, we will be as a school, we would really struggle to ban cell phones in a senior high school where we um, really look at building student agency. Um, we want them to manage their devices, to manage um, their their um, reliance on devices. You know, I too can see the advantages of being less connected. I mean, goodness, I keep. I went to the cell phone shop today and said, there's a problem with my battery. It kept, my, my phone keeps dying. And then he looked through my settings and saw how much time I spend on Instagram every day. And he went, the problem's not your phone. The problem's how much time you spend on Instagram. Um, so, you know, I can I can relate to um, that that small screen addiction problem. Um, and I, I don't, it, the funny thing is, it's not all bad. Um, the, the idea of taking phones away from students the ridiculous thing about that is it's an overly simplistic solution. We know that those social media platforms, their messaging mechanisms are just as accessible on their laptop um, as it is on their telephone. Um, we know that actually for as much as it can be harmful to young people with anxiety, for a lot of our students, there's an element of their devices being a mechanism for self-soothing um, and a way for them to keep connected to family and whānau and actually to feel safe. Um, and their phone is part of that as well. It, a one-size-fits-all solution is not the answer. Yeah, I guess the thing is, the point of raising it is, is how complex this is because you've yes, got this yeah, kind of, yeah. it's yeah. an and, and, and if maybe. You know, and and so I'll be way... really interested to see if any of this sticks in Australia. And indeed, yeah. if it actually sticks when it roll, if it rolls out here in New Zealand as well. Yeah, so so I think part of the conversation I'm reading here in the chat, as well as just the conversation we've had before, is in the momentum has come from from the community. And I think part of it is you know everybody's stretched to the maximum. To your point, it's it's really comfortable and reassuring as parents. So my kids are in school during the day. Hopefully, they'll learn the things I learned and and do well. Or, or you know do better than me, or at least as well as me, depending on which side of the tracks they sit in their in their journey. But actually, you know, obviously, at some point, we need to break that, that people need to be able to come together and say, actually, this is no longer for the purpose. So mm. at the frontier of change, you know, I always talk about we should always develop students, regardless of age, as either activists or academics. You know, activists, because if they stand for something, at least they've, they've got the ability to kind of be heard and actually feel that they're empowered and confident. And, and academics, because if you go into academia, of course, you can validate and, and theorize and prove things and actually give your voice that maybe others don't get. If you get one of those two things, I think you're on a pretty good journey. Mm. But actually, we seem to be unable to drive this conversation back to the community to bring the champions of change to the forefront. Mm. And, you know, putting aside politics, because it's very easy to do that, particularly this week, um, you know, we're going to have a new start again in a month's time. And, you know, have you got any ideas how we could get the voice of the community and each community being reflective of who they serve could be an uprising of change to change the dialogue back into government to saying enough is enough. We have to look at education that's personalised to individuals and is fit for purpose for all and not just for some. You know, have you ever had those moments you wake up at night and go, aha, if we could only do this, or do you think it's actually just impossible? I, I actually think about the climate change movement and the way that young people and young people's voice has has really resonated and, and started to cause, you know, national and global changes in decision making and how we operate. And I, I wonder if what we need to do is is enable and encourage our young people to be the ones who actually speak up and speak out and actually um you know this sounds terrible as a school leader um i i, I would be quite quite happy if we got to a point where there was massive walkouts of young people if they actually walked out of the schools and started saying that this is not i mean they're doing it anyway you only have to look at the attendance data um you know around our country in the senior years it's as little as 20 percent of students are now attending school regularly the trouble is they're doing it in a disconnected um way so you know the climate change stuff has been really well coordinated um and um, really well facilitated and and they have got a real sort of collective sense of voice I wonder where the opportunity is for, as you say, um, how, enabling our young people to become the activists who can change the system from within. Um, because, gosh dang it, us, our, our, us I mean, Cheryl's, um, for, for, you know, fought the, the good fight 
um, for years longer than I have. And I, I continue to fight the good fight with Cheryl at the moment. And I know that at times it feels futile that because we get very quickly, and I'm not putting you in this box, Cheryl, because I know everyone respects you. But I, I quite often get the sense that I get painted as um, someone who is a bit annoying and noisy, and they just wish I would just sit down at the, you know, the Secondary Principals Association. It's like, oh God, here she goes again. What's she going to go on about? Um, and 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 um, so we, we we there's few and far between, and people are not very nice to us for speaking up and speaking out about schools not being fit for purpose. So I, I wonder if the answer is actually the young people doing the speaking up and the speaking out and, and how we might, um, you know, student volunteer army, um, mm -hmm. the likes of that, if they might actually be one that lead the educational revolution. Do you know what? Yeah. Burning cell phones in schools might be a really handy trigger. It, it could be. And, and it, someone here suggested about using a citizen assembly, which, I, you know, yes. for those who don't know is, you know, this idea of a sort of a, a group representative of communities to come together and to look at that change and whether it could be rallied together by an organization to get the assembly off the ground. But I think it is a really good model and it's one that's mm. proven globally is to be a great model to have um, active change within hard moving kind of situations. So it's um, a wicked problem just, though, Francis, because if you look around the world, problem. school systems haven't really changed much anywhere. Yeah. Really. And look, you, you, <laughs> And I've had, you know, the same the same kind of time in, in the tertiary sector having the same fights and trying to mm. move things in that way too. That you know, it's not it's not all about everybody turning up to a lecture hall for three or four years of their life and hoping that what's relevant at the end of their degree is is still relevant when they go into a job. So there's a whole bunch of things that need to shift. But one of the things I want to talk about in this last sort of ten minutes is, in my view, is we're entering this era now where the future of work is so it is so different in terms of how we learn, what we learn, how we work when we work, why we work, you know, all of these things are coming up and AI is going to be at the heart of this. Um, a few months ago, I was inundated by calls from media just talking about plagiarism at schools as though AI was, that was the beginning and the end of AI and not appreciating that this is a tool that's literally now got, you know, tens of thousands of, of options. So it's not just ChatGPT, but a whole bunch of other totally different uh, generative AI tools that are, are truly disrupting um, the world in every sector that I'm aware of. I have never seen a sector that is not in some way compromised or at least ch challenged by generative AI. How do you imagine we're going to start adopting the, the use of generative AI in the education system so that people can understand that jobs in the future will require those skills? Mm -hmm. And how do we shift the thinking that people sort of saying this is a, you know, a bad tool as opposed to saying this is a really useful tool for many reasons for people from all sorts of learning backgrounds mm. so your views on AI in general would be great but also just in school adoption yeah in terms of my views on AI it's about embrace and educate I think um, we're playing a ridiculous game of whack-a-mole if we think we're going to legislate ban or control how it's used I think what that shows is that a lot of people and not the people in this call but a lot of people don't understand how pervasive AI already is in the platforms um, that we use you know they think chat GPT and they think plagiarism they're, they're patently unaware that nearly absolutely every platform tool they use on the internet has got some aspect of AI now woven into it or large language models woven into it um, I so I think like I was at the conference last week, there was a lot of discussions around AI and, a, you know, the keep coming back to, you know, are there, tool, are there tools you can use to detect it? And it's like, no, give, give up, give up. You know, like you, you're, 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 you're fighting a futile um, fight. I hope what we do sooner rather than later is recognise the need to fundamentally change what we assess and how we assess. Um, I think we need to absolutely be ensuring that our young people are numerate and literate and not be overly reliant on AI to do the work and the learning for them, but to instead have really open our our um, our position as a school is that we recognize that it's pervasive. Pandora's box has been open, it's here to stay. So it's therefore our responsibility as teachers to have really open conversations about how we're going to use 
particular tools um, and platforms in specific ways and also having a bit of a traffic light system about when it's inappropriate to use specific tools and platforms because of how assessments work as they are at present. Unfortunately, with NCA, we don't have a whole lot of control over what um, that assessment, those assessment rules look like at this point in time. So I think we're going to have to very quickly get to a point where we say, this is, this is here. It's here to stay. We need to develop some basic understanding of large language models and sort of how they work. I don't think any of us have to be computer programmers. We don't have to understand it in and out, but we need to understand that um, artificial intelligence has the ability to reinforce echo chambers. It has um, the ability to enforce bias. It doesn't give a damn about intellectual property. Um, and so... You know, AI is scouring. I always think of it as like the equivalent of a bottom trawler. It's going through the internet and it's just scooping up all of the crap and, you know, um, and and synthesizing it and coming up with an answer. There's no guarantee that the answer is quality or correct. Um, you know, it, it, it is what it is. It's, it's scouring the existing biases and information that are already existing in the internet. So for me, it is a need to focus on critical things thinking and critical literacy um, and making sure that students students are already using they've got three positions you've got kids who are scared of it and they are not using it or they don't know how to use it so they might be using it within platforms but they're not using it consciously you've got kids who are using it to plagiarize and to do their work for them this is often happening in schools where um where AI has become like a speakeasy within their school because they've banned it on the surface. So the kids just use it anyway underneath and they use it to spew up um, some plagiarized work and do their homework for them. And then you've got schools who are trying to have really open conversations and really getting kids to use it critically and thoughtfully. They will still make missteps. They will still sometimes use it for shortcuts. But it's on us to, as educators to be having really open, transparent conversations going, hey, this is a way you could be using ChatGBT to get some feedback. Or we could have a play around with different tenses or voices or um, lenses um, by, you know, learning how to write really effective prompts um, for, for your, your different AI um, platforms, tools and technologies. Um, but I hope sooner rather than later, we recognize that our formal assessment framework needs to change. We actually... Michelle, we'll just jump in there, Claire, just, just on that, just again, in kind of time, but... A couple of things I just want to just catch. Not all language models are, you know, large language models which are used for generative AI are actually open. So they're not all pulling from open source. So some of them are closed models, which are obviously far more accurate and far more, you know, so you could, you can put it, you know, you could have your own school data, for example, and have a large language model off the back of that, which would then be localized and, and companies do the same thing. Useful. So just want to, and much more useful and much yeah. like, less likely to hallucinate. But so there's that, that aspect of it. Um, I actually am here in Wellington Airport, um, because I've actually just been with NZQA this morning. You'd be pleased to oh, know good. that there is a, glo a global academic integrity network between Australia, New Zealand, and Ireland working on assessments in the world of AI. So there is some conversation starting across the network. What that means, I have no idea, but at least there is uh, an alliance that's happening uh, to think about the effect. Now, it's very, very different to understand so very targeted assessment. I am assessment. achingly worried that in the short term, they'll make kids work on pen and paper, which is just ridiculous. That, that would be and, a, and schools yeah. are already doing that yeah and, and, and so look I think um, as we draw to a close I mean you can see how complex this issue is and I know that we could talk for literally for hours on this and I think there's you know it's huge amounts of admiration for the work you're doing I think anybody has a chance to to talk to Claire and, and her contemporaries who are really at the forefront of pushing change because they see it they see the need they understand the the, the, the need not just today but the need that we need going into the future that we cannot continue to do the same model. So I'll pass back to you, Claire, while I've got announcements going on in the background, just to do a, maybe just a closing about anything you think that individuals on this call could do to just kind of change the way they think of education or the people who are in education in their family and whanau. I, I think one of, I say this to any group of adults that I think are switched on, go join your school board. 
Um, yeah. You've got incredible power, whether you have a child that is school aged or not, there is nothing stopping you being a community member. Boards have an incredible amount of power and influence and have the ability to disrupt at a very local level. So um, one of my things is A, um, get yourself on a school board if you're passionate about changing education or you care about digital equity. Um, I would also say encourage your young people to step up and speak up and speak out and to become activists in their own right um, and also listen to Cheryl Doig that would be my other piece of advice um, I know you probably all do anyway but um, I know the work that she does in, in your context is is leading the way as well as um, the likes of Kayla and the work that she does with BOMA um, in your, your vicinity in your area so the more we can breed activists the better the more that you can go out and be activists on school boards the better as well Cheryl, there's your lovely face. <laughs> Hi, Cheryl. Cheryl, do you want to just make we've got we've got a minute. Do you want to just put your your uh, little 10 cents in? Lovely to see you here too. So yeah. Yeah. come on, Cheryl. Yeah. Come right, on, just, add, add your for, for for me, the power is in, in youth. And and uh, but our our role is to teach them how to be activists in, in a safe way that that is smart. And that's why why I come back to it as adult, adult allies. We need to be futures focused, learn the, the tools of futures, and um, then ensure that our young people uh, have them because it's, it's a, a polarized world. Mm. Thanks, you're a great wise word. So appreciate that. And look, there's a couple of other good suggestions here in the chat, and I appreciate Joe putting in the digital equity dot nz mm. uh, address. A know, real shout out to start. Well. Absolutely, we all know it's a, it's you know, the the, in, the inequity across the um, the divide is is really real, and we need to address that as a, as a sense of priority. Given we're going more and more technical as we look into the future, and technology is going to play a bigger bigger part. I just want to acknowledge everyone who's taken the time to spend the last forty five minutes listening to this conversation. It's a hard conversation to have, and one that a lot of people are extremely passionate about. But it is only through these types of conversations that we can make a difference, and we can start building that momentum of changing the views, particularly parents, I would suggest that we start with the people we know who perhaps are still of the view that the old way is the good way and actually understanding how we can get those views to be changed so they can understand contextualized education for 2023 and beyond. So thanks for everyone. And uh, thank you so much, Claire, for your time. And I think it's school holiday still, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, look, jumping in on holiday. Never, never not an more. educator. <laughs> <laughs> right thanks everybody Kakite, enjoy your afternoon tea break and uh see you again online hopefully kia ora. Nah, kia ora. Thanks, guys, and we'll see you back at 245 jump around rooms as it will and thank you ladies that was incredible and thank you for ending with solutions and calls to action i always love that thank you awesome bye bye bye